Good morning. Good morning. What a glorious day it is. I am so blessed to be back from vacation. My mother thanks you so much for, yes, she does, for the time with her, and so does my sister. And I think I introduced you to my brother-in-law, Charles, in one of my sermons about his tax preparation. Yes, he thanks you as well and knows that he is now very popular. Um, we are so glad that we have come together as as a joint worshiping community of St. Paul's Episcopal Church and First Presbyterian Church Logan. And those of you who are on Facebook Live and later on YouTube, we all come together and worship God and give thanks and praise to God. I have a couple of um, administrative things. Uh, first of all, um, the hymnal is the purple book. Just so you know, that's the hymnal. And um, the little asterisk in the bulletin usually tells you, typically it's correct, the asterisk is, but sometimes it may not be. And usually that's when you stand. And uh, the communion, when we do communion, the great uh, prayer of thanksgiving, the, um, the holy, holy, and the Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, and the amen are sung, and we've given you the hymn numbers. Now, I have a hint for you. It's all the same tune. All three are the same tune, okay? So... If you, if you know the holy, holy, you're going to know the, 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 the Christ has died, etc., and you're going to know the amen. But have your hymnal ready. Oh, uh, the offering. I want to remind you about the offering. Um, the offering will, again, be uh, uh, divided between the two churches' uh, feeding programs, our community meals, uh, on Thursdays. Uh, so please give generously. We come from north and south and east and west, from our living room, our dining room, from St. Paul's, from First Logan, from Facebook Live, to give thanks and praise to God. Let us worship God.
Good morning. Please stand. Join me in a call to worship. Today is Easter Day. When Thomas touched the wounds and set himself free. It was Easter Day. When Peter's three yeses to Jesus finished his three denials. It was Easter Day. When Mary, ready to embalm the dead, ran in fear from the empty tomb. It was Easter Day. It was Easter Day. When Emmaus became synonymous with welcome and the breaking of bread to strangers. It was Easter Day. When Paul was blinded by the light and recognized the voice niggling in his head. It was Easter Day. When Hanani fed the same table as the rich. It was Easter Day. It was Easter Day. When the stranger is welcomed in community and the lonely are restored to relationship. It was Easter Day. For Christ is risen and every day is Easter Day. Let us pray. Living Lord, you meet us in unexpected places and surprise us with the abundance of your love. Feed us by your word and fill us with your spirit so that we may follow you this day and always through Jesus Christ, your son, our savior, and all God's people said, amen. amen.
Before we begin the prayer of confession, let me make note for you that our response of thanksgiving is hymn number 363, Rejoice the Lord is King. It's just the first stanza. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Wondrous God, we confess that at times our doubts and fears override our hope and faith. Forgive us when we lose sight of the joy of your love and instead fall into despair and gloom. Lift up our spirits, Lord, and help us to remember the promise of new life here and now, not just the hope of resurrection for the future. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus the Christ, who continues to offer us new life, who continues to turn us around and upside down, who continues to break down the walls of death in our own life. Forgive us, restore us, and renew us. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray, amen. The tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. There is no darkness now, only light. God continues to renew us and restore us. We are forgiven, loved, and restored, receiving the gift and promise of new life and resurrection now. Thanks be to God, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Let us share signs of the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Let us pray. O God of light, by the power of your Holy Spirit, restore our sight, that in these words of scripture and sermon we may see Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Our first reading today is from Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. Our psalm today is Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life, from among those who have gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved by your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made a supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Please stand for the gospel. Our gospel is from John today. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciple by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon, Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that he was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were able to haul it out because there were so many fish. The disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Is it the Lord? When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go to wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Please be seated. In a way, I feel bad for you all because you have two clergy that have just gotten back from vacation. I feel a little bit like Mick Foley from the Saturday Night Live skit with the great Chris Foley was in the back and he goes, Chris Farley, and he goes, I've been drinking coffee for the last hour and he's ready to come up here and give you a talk. So bear with me if I go, if I go a little too hard. Before we get started, I want to ask a question. 
How many of you love pizza? Love pizza. All right. How many of you love cookies? All right, we're there. All right. How many of you love your significant others or your parents? All right. All right. All right. We're there. We're there. Do you love pizza or cookies the same way that you love your significant others or your parents? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. People are shaking their head. But we said we loved them, right? And we loved pizza and cookies like we loved our parents. The problem with the English language is that we only have one word for love. We don't get to sort of space it out or use differentiations. We don't get, there's no gray area where we can say, I like this, but I love this. In the Greek, it gets a little hairier, which then makes the gospel passage make just a little bit more sense, right? Jesus shows up. He's on the sea. They're out there fishing because they didn't know what else to do because they've been in fear and they've been, the, the, uh, the disciples have been in fear. They're in the upper room and they're scared to death. So every time they've come down and they watched Christ die, they've gone right back up to the upper room where they celebrated the Last Supper. Then they come down, they poke their heads out. Is it safe? Is it not? What do we do? And then they've heard some of these, these accounts of Jesus being raised from the dead, and they're not really sure what to do. So they keep going sort of home to mama. They keep going back to the upper room. And so this is the first time, because now you're about a week after the resurrection, and they go, what do we do? And some of them go, we're going to go do what we've always done. Because it's the safest thing we can do. So they go back to making a living. They go back to fishing. You could question the bathing suit and the attire that Peter had, but apparently fishing naked was a thing. <laughs> we should probably say this homily is about PG-13 rated, because we're going to get into some stuff. So, but, but Peter's out there half naked, he's fishing, he's doing all of this stuff out there. And then they go, cast, and then you hear Jesus go, put the net in the other side. And they go, well, all right, because these guys have been fishing their entire life and don't realize there's two sides of a boat, so we should probably chuck the net to the other side. So they chuck the net to the other side, and they get such a haul of fish, and they bring it ashore. Jesus is there with a fire and he's ready to cook fish. Why? Because he wants to show them that there's something different about this resurrected body. It's not a ghost. He's not Casper. He's not Slimer from the Ghostbusters. He's not going in and out of walls. He's sitting there and he's eating fish. This body, this resurrected body needs something. So he's sitting there and he eats breakfast with them. And then he starts looking at Peter remembering what happened on Good Friday and remembering Peter denying him three times before the cock crows. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? <gasps> Similar to my question of do you love pizza, right? But Jesus is using the Greek word agape. Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you love me? with a love that burns hot and never ends. And Simon Peter responds, Yes, Lord, you know that I philos you. You know that I love you like a brother. That's where we get our word for Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? So he says, Simon, Simon, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother. Peter goes, it's going to be a long one. So he goes, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Simon Peter looks at him and says, Yes, Lord, you know that I eros you. You know that I love you. It's where we get our word for erotic. I told you this was going to be PG-13. Don't blame the messenger. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you with this hot and burning love that burns so fire but then dies out. Yes, Lord, I love you like that. Son, Jesus goes, well, we know we are going to be here a while. One more time. Let's do it. He says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Flip to Simon Peter. The light bulb goes off. 
Oh, now I know what he wants. Yes, Lord, you know that I agape you. You know that I love you. Finally, on this third try, and after Peter gets exasperated with our Lord for asking him three times, do you love me? He finally gets and goes, yes, Lord, I love you the same way that you love me. Because every time Jesus asks the question, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Peter responded with two other types of love until he finally gets it right. Until he finally says, yes, Lord, I love you the same that you love me. He finally gets it. Which then makes that gospel passage make a little bit more sense. And why I went from pizza to cookies to your significant other to try to point, no, they have different versions of that type of love. And in the end, what Jesus wanted from Peter was the same kind of love that he showed him. And what type of love was it that Jesus shows Peter? Peter got to be oh with Jesus on all the important bits in his life. He got to see the transfiguration. He got to do all those things. He got to see with Jesus and be with him in the upper room. And he even had the opportunity, the invitation, to come and witness the judgment and crucifixion of Jesus. But he got scared. Think back to Good Friday. We all were here. Think back to those questions that the, that the people asked him by Peter's warming himself by the fire. I do not know the man. And then the cock crows because that's the third time Peter denied him. I do not know the man. To a week later going, I love you the same way that you love me. In the person of Peter, we see each and every one of us. Those times when we've screwed up, those times when we've fallen away from the Lord, those times that we've done things that we know we shouldn't, I do not know the man, he yelled at that poor lady. I don't know him. Leave me alone. To being face to face with Christ in his resurrected body. Yes, Lord, I love you with the same love that you have for me. That love that gathered them in the upper room. That love that overwent the judgment of Pilate. That love that led him to the cross to hang there for three hours for us. That love that not only sin and death couldn't hold him back from the tomb. That's the love that Jesus required from Peter. And in the end, if you read the rest of Peter's life, that's the love that he showed him. That little bit of prophecy that Jesus gives Peter at the end of the gospel today was true. You're going to be led somewhere where you do not want to go. Led him to Rome. You are going to die a way that glorifies me. To the point that Peter tells his executioners because he wouldn't deny Jesus again. It says, I don't want to die on the same way that Jesus died. So they turn the cross upside down. That's the love that Peter finally shows Jesus. That's the love that we're called to. Jesus goes to the cross because he loves us. His arms are outstretched on the cross because he wants to embrace us. His love is there for us. We could be like Judas and run away and go and commit suicide because we can't handle that love. Or we could be like Peter who turns to Jesus and goes, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. As we leave this place today, we're faced with the choices. We're faced with choices each and every day, each and every minute of every day. Do I know the man? And if I do, do I love him? Or do I know the man and I run away from him? Amen. <laughs>
come to this table to be nourished, to be fed, and to be transformed so that we can go out into the world and be the living Christ to say we know the Christ and we love the Christ and we will feed and tend the sheep and the lambs and we will follow in the way of Christ. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is not the table of First Presbyterian Church Logan. This is God's table. And all are welcome to be nourished and fed and transformed. Please join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name and no faith and no future, you called us your children. When we lost our way or turned away, you did not abandon us. When we came back to you, your arms opened wide in welcome. And look, you prepare a table for us, offering not just bread, not just the cup, but your very self, so that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, blessed, and made new. Lord Jesus Christ, present with us now, for all that you have done and all that you have promised, what have we to offer? Our hands are empty. Our hearts are sometimes full of wrong things. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs from under your table. But for us, you were born. For us, you healed, preached, taught, and showed the way to heaven. For us, you were crucified, and for us, after death, you rose again. As we walk this journey of life, we remember these gifts as we proclaim the mystery of faith. So as we do in this place what you did in an upstairs room, send down your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup, that they may become for us your body, healing, forgiving, and making us whole, and that we may become for you your body, loving and caring in the world until your kingdom comes. Create in us a new community of abundant love that we may be life-giving disciples of Christ, one with each other, one in unity with you through the Holy Spirit, and one in ministry to the world. All this we pray in the name of the Christ child who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. After table fellowship with his friends, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. And then he broke it. And he said, take, eat, remember me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you in my blood for the forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. Drink and remember me. And as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, do so remembering me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. bread of life.
the cup of peace. We thank you, O oh God, of power that the risen Christ is in this place. We thank you for the privilege of sharing in this communion meal with the one who first shared it with the disciples in the upper room and shares it still in the power of the resurrection. Bless us as we go forth from this place and keep our hearts filled with the wonder of your love. Amen. We respond to the love that God has shown us through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus Christ in various ways, by engaging in faithful acts, by bringing our tithes and offerings of tangible goods and of our very self. We have a number of announcements. Um, First of all, welcome to St. Paul's. What a glorious, glorious celebration this is. And um, venerable and Father, we are so glad that you are here and that everyone from St. Paul's congregation is here. It's such a blessing to have you and to know that we are connected, that we are the church universal. Thank you so very much. Um, a point of privilege here, if I may. Uh, Saturday, May the 7th, um, my nephew, Andrew Miller, and his partner, Katie Barr, will be here. Uh, Andrew is um, an operatic singer in the Boston area, and his partner is, they call them collaborative pianists in the Boston area, and they will be at the Bowen House uh, for a concert. They will be doing poetry set to music. Some of the poets are Tennyson, William Blake, one of my favorites. So it'll be a unique experience at the Bowen House. Earlier that day at 10, um, 10 to noon, is that right, Martha? 10 to noon, we will have the second annual, woohoo, second annual uh, plan exchange that benefits the Bowen House. And we will also have our chair a tea auction. And uh, we have, you know how you accumulate things in your church? I'm sure you all don't have that experience, do you? No, okay, that's good, that's good. Well, we Presbyterians, we tend to sometimes collect things, right? And so we had a myriad of wooden chairs that we didn't know what to do. So uh, a bunch of us had been to the uh, uh, museum, in, uh, the Decorative Arts Museum in Lancaster, and we were having lunch. We thought, what a great fundraiser chair a tea, get it, ha <laughs> ha, chair a tea, if we all took a chair and we decorated it and then we auctioned it off and it would benefit um, our uh, community meal. And so you artists have taken the chairs and the, uh, the wonderful artists at HVI, Can Do Creations, have taken a children's table and children's chairs, and they're going to decorate them, and they'll all be on auction uh, at the Bowen House on the grounds, weather permitting. So that will take place on Saturday. Don't forget, Sunday is Mother's Day. Okay, just a reminder, just a reminder. We know, we know this, all that we are, and all that we have, whether it's painting chairs, whether it's loving pizza, adoring our parents, but we know that all that we are and all that we have is a gift from God. So let us generously and with gratitude give back those gifts to God.
us pray. We praise you, O God, and give you thanks that you have given us such joy, such grace, and such hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let our lives be proof of that good news, that we know Christ and that we love Christ. Let all our words and actions, our love and service, bear witness to that knowledge and love and to Christ's resurrection power. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Westminster, which is down the stairs out here and into the uh, Fellowship Hall. It's called Westminster House. And for a reception for our wonderful brothers and sisters from St. Paul's. Um, nibbles and noshes and good things to drink. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father Almighty. And as you go, remember, by the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very moment. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen.